tell you what our speech, I don't really have a speech. Welcome everybody, we might, might get started now. I'd just like to welcome you all to the 15th annual J Hall Lecture. Uh, I'll speak a little bit more in a moment and introduce Marshall, who's our guest lecturer tonight. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Greg Marston, who's uh, a former head of school in the School of Social Science, as well as the Deputy Executive Dean. So I'll pass over to you now, Greg, to say a few words. Uh, thanks, Chris, and welcome everyone tonight. It's always an exciting event on the, the Haas calendar in terms of the annual J Hall lecture. Um, and I'd also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional the custodians of the lands on which we meet and gather tonight and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and to recognise that this place has always been a place of teaching and learning. Um, long before this beautiful building stood here, which it is a lovely building, which is perhaps underutilised in the last couple of years. Um, and also I think in terms of the connections between UQ archaeology and uh, traditional owners and Indigenous communities in Australia. So UQ archaeology has got a reputation across the region and globally, but it's also made a wonderful contribution to Australia and Australian archaeology um, and really important uh, discoveries that Chris and, and colleagues and Marshall's colleagues have been involved in the time that I was head of school. Um, I am the Deputy Executive Dean and former head of school, but also tonight I'm here representing the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, who had a clash, unfortunately. Uh, the Vice-Chancellor also had a clash. So I'm feeling a little bit like Scott Morrison in terms of numbers of portfolios and job titles <laughs> that I'm representing here tonight. Um, they, of course, it's an important occasion in terms of the lecture, but it's also an important occasion in terms of recognising the contribution of a colleague uh, who's made an enormous uh, impact and, and really has been a builder. That was another metaphor that was thrown around during the election, bulldozers are builders, and bulldozers have nothing to do or should never be near an archaeology dig site, right? <laughs> so uh, Marshall has been a builder. I came into the school in 2016, which was 10 years, I think, if I'm correct, after Marshall uh, had been building the program, taking over from Jay. Um, and there was so much that had been done in that time in terms of the facilities, in terms of the work integrated learning experience, build trips, a wonderful PhD program, and, and world-class research, and that, that legacy will uh, obviously live on long after uh, not Marshall gives up his paid job, but the other beauty of being an emeritus, I think there's always this kind of scar scarcity around the title of being an emeritus professor, and we put people through a lot of paperwork to get it, but it's really that um, people go on doing what they do, but they don't get paid for it anymore at the universities. Not, I don't think it's such a good deal, but it, it is something that's highly regarded, and we're really looking forward to Marshall's contribution to the school and the university continuing. Um, I think that's most of what I want to say is just to, to recognise and acknowledge that um, as head of school, when Marshall was in the, there was not much advice I could give him as a very seasoned and academic and a senior leader. Um, the only thing I could do was around fishing tips and Marshall I think has got a few photos perhaps he told me of, of some fish that he's been, uh, maybe been catching I hope. So I'll hand back to Chris to introduce the lecture, but I'm um, really looking forward to this evening, and I'll see most of you outside for the reception. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Greg. Well, first of all, I'd just like to say that uh, this lecture has been going for 15 or 7, oh, I think it's actually more like 17 years now. We've had a gap in one or two spots, but it's uh, a, a chance to pay homage to Jay Hall, who is the founding member of archaeology at UQ. Uh, many years ago now and um, each year we have this annual lecture and we often bring in uh, speakers from around the world and all of these lectures have been fantastic so uh, our speaker tonight will also be fantastic Professor Marshall Weisler and I'd just like to give a little uh, introduction to Marshall who I'm sure needs no introduction I'm sure you all know who Marshall is he's been teaching here now for about uh, 15 years or, or more and Marshall received his PhD 30 years ago from UC Berkeley he's undoubtedly a world expert in Pacific archaeology and also in fishbone analysis and he's much sought after by researchers around the world to identify fish and to help them with their fish analyses. He's been the head of the archaeology program from 2006 through to 2017. He has many uh, prestigious fellowships that recognize his leadership and uh, 
um, had, uh, his uh, ability in the field, for instance, the fellowship at, of the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in France, Linnaean Society of London, Society of Antiquities of London, election to the uh, Australian Academy of Humanities as well. So a very uh, wonderful list of, of uh, fellowships that we all hope that we might be able to join in the future. His research interests include island colonization strategies, human adaptation to island ecosystems, identification and development of prehistoric long distance trade and interaction, understanding long term changes in marine exploitation through the identification of fishbone, and sustainability of low coral islands and atolls during the last two millennia. Marshall's been involved in research projects uh, in some of the most beautiful parts of the world, I'm sure you'll agree, and I had the pleasure of joining him on some field work in Hawaii a few years back, uh, looking at some of the most astounding sites on the top of Mauna Kea, a huge volcano, five kilometers up in the air, uh, with these amazing quarries uh, dedicated to the production of adzes, uh, which of course tickles my fancy as a bit of a rock jock. He's worked uh, in Hawaii, New Zealand, the Pitcairn Group, French Polynesia, Cook Islands, Samoa, and the Marshall Islands. And as a result of this, has published a staggering 154 articles and has attracted many, many millions of grants. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Marshall to come forward and give us his retirement annual J Hall lecture. Thank you, Marshall. Thanks, Chris. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming out. I wanted to begin by posing the very simple question of why do archaeology in the first place? What attracts people to do archaeology? Why would you spend your life doing archaeology? There's so many other things in the world to do. And <clears throat> as a colleague of mine and a colleague of Jay's, and Andy as well, is when I worked at the Bishop Museum in Hawaii many years ago, Doug pulled me aside and said, Marshall, if it's no fun, then don't do it. And that sounds like something simple to say, but it really is at the basis, the foundation of deciding that, yeah, archaeology is something that I want to spend my life doing because it's incredibly fun, especially being out in the field. And yes, it comes with all the other intellectual challenges, but if you don't wake up and go, you're out in the field and you go, wow, what am I going to find today? You know, that's, that really, I find that to be absolutely fabulous. So today I'm going to look at uh, three case studies. And um, the first one is how do societies survive or not? So I'm going to look at a case study and, and show you uh, some of my long-term research to how, do, how do societies actually survive in the long run, especially isolated communities and resource poor areas. The second one is how do Pacific Islanders adapt to the most precarious landscapes on the planet? the most precarious landscapes on the planet. How do people actually live on these landscapes? And the case study I'm going to show you, for over 2,000 years, people have lived on the most precarious landscapes on our planet. How do they do that? The third one is taking a look at the archaeology and how archaeology contributes to indigenous communities, and especially vice versa. Now. Some of you in the audience would uh, possibly remember when this album came out in 1967. I certainly do. But uh, <clears throat> there's a song on there about getting by with a little help for your friends. And that pretty much epitomizes what this case study is all about. So we're going to take a look at Southeast Polynesia and the Pitcairn Group. And we're going to show you what went on there a long time ago. But before we do, there's a couple of things that I came across <clears throat> which I found really remarkable. And that is the story of the mutiny on the bounty. It's the greatest sea saga of all time. 
greatest mutiny that ever took place in Britain, the British fleet, the greatest mutiny ever. And this is pretty amazing stuff. Now, the captain on the vessel in which the mutiny took place was none other than William Bly. And that's the relative right there, our very own Anna Bly. I say, geez, what a connection that is. And we also have a connection here. There's been numerous films made about Mutiny on the Bounty with Marlon Brando and Trevor Howard, if you go back that far. But in 1984, our very own Mel Gibson. So another Australian connection to this research. But there's more. And I couldn't believe this either. Now, who doesn't know about the story of Moby Dick? It's a true story. The whale ramming the Essex in 1821. <laughs> and one of the seamen, Thomas Chappell, 1821, wrote a firsthand narrative of what it was like to be rammed by a whale in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. This was read by Herman Melville, who produced Moby Dick in 1851, and then picked up again by Nathaniel Philbrook, who wrote this New York Times bestseller, In the Heart of the Sea, and there was so much adventure I highly recommend reading these books if you haven't already. But of course, they had to make it into a film, and we have yet another Australian connection here. So I found all this stuff really uh, quite remarkable. I just want you to, uh, let's see if I get this. Yeah, so here's where the Essex was rammed. 1,500 kilometers south, they got into the Pitcairn group. These people, from this whaling vessel, the small whaling uh, boats drifted, ended up on Henderson Island. And I'm going to talk to you about Henderson Island tonight. I actually saw some of the stuff that these guys left in the caves on Henderson. <clears throat> OK, so here's the timeline. 1790, mutiny on the bounty the, for all the places that the bounty mutineers could have showed up. They ended up on Pitcairn Island. 1821, the Essex is struck by the whale. The survivors end up on Henderson Island in the Pitcairn group. Fast forward 150 odd years, and there I am on Henderson Island. So it's pretty cool to be able to touch these historical narratives. OK, so how did small communities on isolated islands with limited resources survive in the long run or not? OK, just to familiarize yourself, here we are in Brisbane, 7,000 Ks over to uh, Pitcairn. And to put this in a kind of more of a reality perspective, because what's 7,000 Ks, you know? But it's actually 2,000 Ks away from the nearest doctor. So this is very isolated. You can't get there on a plane. You can only get there by chartered, chartered uh, boat, sailboat. <clears throat> so just a little bit of background. This is Mangareva. This is three and a half day sail away from uh, the Pitcairn group. It's a high volcanic group of high volcanic islands. It's got a very beautiful lagoon that's uh, 10 Ks across. There's lots of black lip pearl shell in the lagoon. That's a very important resource for making fish hooks, uh, ornaments, vegetable peelers. It's a really important commodity in prehistory. And uh, those of you that would be familiar with cultured black pearls, that's the uh, oyster that are used to culture black pearls. The vast majority of all the black pearls in the, in the world come out of French Polynesia. The first of a few uh, fishing slides for Greg, wherever you are. I wanted to put this in for you. 
Um, so, Mangareva, high volcanic island, uh, good soils for producing uh, all manner of very important food, taro, sweet potato, coconut, breadfruit, uh, inshore and pelagic fishing. This is a yellow fin tuna. Uh, and here's our research vessel. As I mentioned before, you can't just get to Pitcairn on a plane. Uh, you actually have to charter. And this research vessel was part of the expedition, which I'll talk a little bit more about. So off to the Pitcairn Island group. Again, there's a very isolated part of the world. It consists of four islands. The high volcanic island of Pitcairn, it's only four and a half square kilometers. It's tiny. When they call for a potluck dinner on the island these days, I've spent uh, quite a few expeditions there. So if someone wants to have a potluck dinner, everyone in the whole island shows up. There's not a lot of people there. So that's Henderson Island, which I'll talk more about. That's a raised limestone island and two small atolls. So colonized about 700 years ago and Pitcairn has a good soil, but not a lot of water, not a lot of good pot potable water and restricted reefs. And this is where the bounty was sunk by the mutineers. And of course it was sunk in Bounty Bay. Where else would you sink her Majesty's service, the bounty. That's a, a recreation of the bounty and yet another fishing photo right here. That's uh, uh, Mr. Warren Reynolds, who uh, was an expert carver and uh, we'd go out fishing with the, with the mob. And this is the last uh, mutineer to survive on Pitcairn. John Adams lasted until 1829. So this is Pitcairn, uh, <clears throat> this is the, uh, oh, there we go, oh, no, okay, there we go. So that's Adamstown right there, that's the main street, and this is how you get around on the island these days. So I'd load up all my equipment on there and take off to a different part of the island and do my archaeology. Now, when I talk about getting by with a little help from your friends. How do we do that in prehistory? How do we do that in archeology? span Well, we have to be able to chart the distribution of trade items. And Pitcairn has a lot of very important uh, commodities, especially this uh, fine-grained basalt, which are made into these adzes. This is an adz blade that's hafted on a handle. And the largest source in the whole of Southeast Polynesia is on Pitcairn Island. There's a volcanic glass source right here, a place called Down Rope. And as an aside, these names on Pitcairn, here you have an island that's four and a half square kilometers in size. There are over 400 place names on the island. You can't even walk from here to over there without hitting another place name. It's, it's, really, it's really an amazing place. And uh, you can see here some stone fish hooks. The only other place in the whole Pacific that makes stone fish hooks is Rapa Nui or Easter Island. Scoria for abrading tools because there's not a lot of coral, which is normally used for abrading. So, uh, and then these red dots represent habitation areas. Now, here's the mob that I worked with for uh, five months on an uninhabited island of Henderson. So you go off to an island, you've never met any of these people before in your life, and you're gonna spend five months with them. You gotta have the adventurous spirit to do that. Oh, this or, this uh, expedition was organized by Cambridge. It was the Sir Peter Scott expedition to the Pitcairn Islands. And the whole reason that all these biologists wanted to go there, because they wanted to go to a pristine island. And that was really good because I'm glad they organized this expedition because they wanted to have an archeologist come with. And of course, I, my hand went up, I say, yep, I'll go. And off I went with them. And uh, I had to give them the bad news that uh, really there's nowhere on the planet that's pristine. This is the most pristine island of its kind, but it's not 
pristine. <clears throat> but all these different topics right here was really marvelous because we had experts looking at all these different things on the island. And it was just really great to be able to talk with these people all the time. This is a little bit of village uh, camp life. That's our camp, having, uh, having a meal and lots of good fishing there, of course. And this is Rosie, she's an ornithologist, but she had a special respect in our small community because she knew how to make wine out of rice. <laughs> and she had the very good sense to bring with several cans of make your own beer. So she was just fantastic to have on the project. Now, every three months we'd get supplies. And of course the most important supplies you can ever have in an uninhabited island in terms of food is chocolate, of course. So we'd all sit down around the table and we'd take our turns about who gets to pick what brand of chocolate. And as the chocolate supplies dwindled and you didn't want to perhaps do your camp chores that week, you can always break off a piece of chocolate and give it to someone that wanted the chocolate more than me doing my camp chores. Okay, so here's Henderson Island. Raised limestone island, 37 square k's, no standing water, low rainfall, rough terrain, only patches of gardening soil. So you think about this and you go, what? People lived here for 800 years? <clears throat> so this is what the island looks like. And uh, hey, another fishing picture. But this is the North Beach. This is the South End. You, this is what is called a karst topography. is razor sharp, very difficult to walk over. Imagine not having boots. How the Polynesians lived on this island is really something. This is the, uh, the East Beach. There's no Polynesian place names because the island was abandoned before Western contact. So we had to name. These names are now in the literature. These are the actual names. This is the rugged interior. You can see the karst topography here. And a typical thing of raised limestone islands is that they're very, very flat. Okay, so just a little background on the archaeology. I did a survey of most of the island. I didn't go into every square meter of the interior, but all the coastlines. I did transects. So this is what the settlement system looks like. Most of the sites are on the north part of the east beach, on the north beach, a couple of sites on the northwest beach, and one site on the south end. And I'm sure that when we went to that site on the south end, we were the first people that had ever been to that part of the island in centuries. Here's some of our excavations here. We did transects uh, on the north beach. The preservation was absolutely mind-boggling fantastic. And uh, <clears throat> what you can see right here this is a square meter, which we often dig in square meters. Imagine five centimeters thick. That's all the food bones in one square meter and five centimeters thick. It's enormously dense. So I was able to study 150,000 bones of fish, bird, turtle. Uh, I did all the fish. And another guy did all the, the bird. I did all the turtle, etc. But here's something that was really striking is that there are three skulls of the green sea turtle that were placed, which for us archeologists, when we find something like that, we go, ah, that looks a bit like ritual to me, you know? That's not just getting rid of their, their food waste. Okay, here's some shots of the habitat, courtesy of the marine biologist that was on the expedition. Uh, the sites are dominated by inshore species, there's about 20 fish families that I identified. Most of these are typically inshore. Just give you some examples of what these habitats look like. And the other thing I wanted to do in terms of subsistence is I fashioned the square meter 
and I did marine transects on different areas of the island and recorded the abundance and diversity of shellfish. And turns out that this turbo mollusk right here represents the vast majority of shellfish in the sites. And because it's an uninhabited island, the bird life was absolutely amazing. And, uh, you know, I, I took all these photographs, but it's only because the, you can get right up to the birds. You know, they, they kind of look a little agitated when you get really close to them, but you can get really close to them. Uh, and this is a flightless bird. This is incredibly rare to be able to see a flightless bird that's still alive on a Pacific island. A little guy about this big that the Pitcairners refer to as the chicken bird. And uh, this is my favorite shot of a little fairy tern, frigate birds, the endemic Henderson fruit dove. So when did ac uh, interaction begin? The, what's the evidence for interaction between Mangareva and the Pitcairn group? Because I want to be able to see what's going on in terms of interaction. So how can we actually find out the interaction? How long it's going on for? When did it start? When did it stop? So these are the things I looked at. We're back to the pearl shell again, which has been imported from Mangareva. This is the local uh, pearl shell that's on Henderson Island. You can see that it's much smaller and it's thinner and it's much inferior, much more inferior as a resource. And plants were introduced. These are typical Polynesian introduced plants. This is cordyline, which grows in Brisbane. It's on our campus here. Coconut, uh, giant swamp taro, a relative of this, grows on campus as well. And uh, candlenut. And these are the archaeological signatures right here. Coconut shell, uh, the leaf of a giant swamp taro, and the uh, nutshell of uh, candlenut. This is the archaeological remains. So this is what the interaction sphere looks like. So we've got uh, stone resources coming in from Mangareva into the Pitcairn group, plants, very important Polynesian introduced plants coming into the Pitcairn group, in including banana, hibiscus you'd be familiar with, and stone resources from Pitcairn going into Henderson as well as back into Mangareva. So in terms of the sequence, we see that there's lots of imported goods. All these artifacts are being imported from elsewhere into Henderson prior to the 1500s. And by the late 1500s, all of this material gets replaced by the inferior pearl shell, uh, beach rock instead of stone material that can have a really sharp edge. And the shell adzes are being used, shell is being used as a raw material to make adzes, also an inferior material. So we get this marked change at this time period. <clears throat> so I spent a lot of time dating these sites. There's uh, 65 radiocarbon dates from the sites. I dated the bottoms and the tops of all the sites. And if we look at this histogram right here, you can see in the early time, about 800 or so years ago, we just get the buildup of the population. But see this drastic fall right here, just like falling off a cliff right here. And when that happens, that's when all the imports stop. So when you need your friends to get by and your friends aren't there anymore and you're on a resource poor island, boom, you can't survive. So. Why was the Pitcairn group abandoned? Well, I just told you. No more contact. Those small, isolated communities couldn't survive anymore. And one thing which is absolutely striking is nothing less than shocking. I got to pause for drama. Check this out. 
So that's when I was there in 1990 to 92. Nice, beautiful white sand beach. This is the same exact beach taken from a very similar part of the beach. And this is what it looks like today. Now I could show you several before and afters from different parts of the Pacific, whether I'm in Hawaii or elsewhere. This plastic has really uh, taken over, as we all know, but this is pretty drastic. Okay, so case study number two. How did Pacific Islanders survive on the most precarious land forms on the planet? And we look at photographs like this and we go, paradise, you know, it's paradise. Especially when it's winter time and they want to, the travel agents want you to buy tickets to go somewhere in the tropics. It's always paradise. But you know, I wouldn't want to work anywhere else, but not paradise all the time. So, what's an atoll in the first place? What is a low coral atoll? Now here I take great joy in citing Darwin. Circular groups of coral islets. And that's what you see right here. These are coral islets on a reef platform. And you can see how these form from a high volcanic island over hundreds of thousands of years, this island gradually subsides, forms a fringing reef, and then a barrier reef, and then eventually an atoll. And there are more than 400 atolls across the planet, most of which are on uh, the Pacific, in the Pacific Ocean. And here's where they are right here, and I'm just gonna talk a bit about uh, the Marshall Islands where I've got another long-term project. So atoll characteristics. And one thing, when, when you read over these characteristics, once again, that red flag comes up. How do people live on these landscapes? And that's the first time I ever went on into an atoll after having 20, pl 20 plus, 30 plus years of archeological field experience. When I went on to the atoll, I, I just, you know, it just really strikes you. These islands, they're only this far above sea level. That's their average elevation above sea level. They're made out of sand. It's unconsolidated sand. There's no high ground. There's no good soils for gardening. But they've got an enormous amount relative to land area, very rich fauna. These are uh, skipjack and yellowfin tuna, just partially as one partial sortie. <laughs> you can see what these atoll uh, islets look like here. So it's a very precarious place to live in the long term. So how did they do that? Now, atolls are made out of biogenetic material. And this is fantastic for archaeologists because biogenetic material can be dated. So when you look at the shell, the coral, the foraminifera, which are these little tiny millimeter size uh, animals that float around in the ocean and when they die, they come ashore by wave action. So if we dig a hole right here, a trench, that box right there, the bottom of that trench, there's lots of coral and forams in here. And that's important because as archaeologists, we always want to date the oldest. We always want to find out the oldest site because that starts the clock when we can look at change over time. And that's the business we're in, to look at changes in societies, communities over time. So what you can do with these biogenetic materials, here's an example of the forearms right here. And I couldn't help but put this in because they look like they're related. So what we do, what I've done, is we look at this islet right here. There's the islet right there. Here's the atoll. That's the islet. And I put uh, excavation transect across the uh, islet, took sediments out of there, and dated the formation of the islet, dated the time that the atoll was emerged above sea level when people could actually live on those landforms. So this is a really incredible 
aspect of doing atoll archaeology because you can actually date the landscape. So from an archaeological point of view, I can say this archaeological site is sitting on this sand that has an age of X, for example. So I know that the archaeological site can only post-date that landscape. So the Marshall Islands emerged about 2,000 years ago, and just to say it once more, it's a fantastic opportunity in which to do archaeology because the landforms are constrained by time. <clears throat> so we can look at the Marshall Islands as the canary in the coal mine. So what happens there is going to happen everywhere else. So there's a couple photographs here. This is the ocean coming up onto the land. These are trees here. The, la the sea is encroaching on the land. The waves are battering the shoreline. And this is what's happening to the archaeology. You get these scars, these truncated shorelines. <clears throat> this is a photograph that I took about 10 years ago. And I was on that island 15 years before that. And that was solid land back then. I've stood with elders in a village where we stood on the lagoon shore and they pointed, they pointed at Kelsey about that far away. And they said, that's where my gardens were when I was a young boy. So this is something that's happening quite rapidly. So I want to instill that the time could not be better to study atolls because these are not going to be there. Not too much longer. Now I've summarized a lot of what I'm going to be talking about in the next few minutes in a book chapter on the Marshall Islands, the archaeology of a drowning nation. And that's exactly what's happening. So here's the study area. And one thing I want to point out so here's the background for the Marshall Islands, 29 atolls, five small islands, about 200 square k's uh, of land, greatly dispersed over 2 million square kilometers of ocean. And surprisingly, they all speak the same language there. That's a lot of distance in prehistory to be dispersed. So here's the archipelago right here. And one thing I want to point out is the rainfall gradient from the north, 1,550 millimeters, down to about 6,000 in the wet south. And I wanted to say, you know, atolls really as a group of islands, as a class of islands, they're all pretty much the same. They're very, very similar. So how can I tease out variability? How can I find out if there is real differences in the archaeology and prehistory of atolls? And so I speculated that it might have something to do with the rainfall gradient. And if you look at this gray box right here, you'd see very strongly correlated rainfall from the dry north, the middle of the archipelago, which is right there, the wet south, which is right down there. So the rainfall versus the modern population against the amount of gardening area and the amount of shell adzes tools that I found on the surface that I use as a proxy to look at population and prehistory. So you can see that rainfall is very strongly correlated to these characteristics. And I'm glad it worked out that way. You know? Now, before work begins in these isolated parts of the planet, there's fishing and feasting. And I don't just say that again because I want to talk about fishing again. But when you go into an isolated community, people you've never met before, the one way to, uh, I find, to break down cultural barriers and to feel comfortable with, with everyone, them with me, me with them, et cetera, is to go out fishing, especially pelagic fishing, because they don't get an opportunity to do that uh, as often as they would like. So we go out pelagic fishing, get lots of tuna, come back in, 
make sure that the chief gets the choice fish and share out fish to the rest of the community. And then uh, later in the, in the evening or day, we feast. The women come out and sing songs and uh, lots of baskets of food are brought. And it just makes everything just, you know, so much easier that everyone now feels like all the barriers are broken down. I'm not just another rubelli, as they call white folks that happen to show up that want something, but it's, I want to be able to work with them. And one of the things that uh, I find especially uh, rewarding is talking to the chief. And what invariably happens is the chief asks me, how long have we been here? And where did we come from? And I just go, yes. I can answer those questions as an archaeologist. I can provide this information to you. And, you know, it's like, it's like your best moments, you know, like perhaps being a teacher when something really works good in a classroom or something. It's kind of in that area, but to be able to talk to the people, it's their prehistory, and we can tell them something about it through the work that we do. I just find an incredibly uh, rewarding experience. So just a little bit of background in village life and the modern economy. You can imagine on really small specks of land like this that the landscape is totally managed. They know where every tree is because they're all of economic importance. They know where their land boundaries are to their uh, traditional land units. So here's a map uh, that I made from the lagoon halfway across the largest islet. And this is where the modern village is. This is where the ancient village was located. And these are the gardening areas right here. These are prehistoric gardening areas that are still used today. Just some examples of a cookhouse. You can see the smoke coming up through the roof. Some sleeping houses here. And this is one of my uh, favorite kind of shots because this is the the intersection of prehistory, traditional ways, and what's happening in modern times. <clears throat> so you get a traditional thatched house, western style door, sitting on a concrete foundation, plastic water tank, bicycle, and solar panel. So where's an anthropologist when you need them, you know? Perfect place to study material culture. So where does fresh water come from on an atoll? Where do these guys get water? The basic stuff that you need. You can't go without it, of course. <clears throat> now, the islets are just made out of sand. It's not consolidated. It's loose sand. The rainwater comes down, percolates through the sand, and then it hits the seawater. The fresh rainwater is lighter than seawater because it's not full of salt. And so the water just rests. <clears throat> so what atoll dwellers figured out is if they dig down into the islet, they can hit that fresh water lens. And that made everything possible, because now they had fresh water. <clears throat> and here's what they do with their fresh water. We take a look at this islet right here. This is the elevation transect. It's been exaggerated in the vertical. But what you can see in the middle of the islet, you can see these pits. And they knew not only to dig pits to get the fresh water, but they knew if they went in the center of the islet, that's where the fresh water is the thickest. And over generations of inhabitants, they'd throw plant material into the pits, they'd old fish bones, whatever organic material they'd put into the pits, and they'd build up a nice rich muck soil. And that's where they grow these carbohydrate-rich tubers that you can see right here. That's a cooked tuber right there. As bland as bland can be, but there it is. And they selected a variety of aeroid uh, is Certisperma. And these produce corms that can be as big as my leg. And it becomes 
It's their refrigerator. It's a source of food. They don't have to harvest this in so many months. They can harvest that whenever the need arises. So it's a fantastic uh, adaptation, selecting the kind of aeroid that is more uh, salt tolerant than these others here. And another innovation, there's two more right here. This is pandanus, this grows on our campus. And this is the pandanus droop, and you'll see how big it is. That's my hand. That pandanus droop would fill the palm of my hand. The ones on campus in northern Queensland, they're about this big, and you wouldn't want to eat those. But these are truly delicious. And they make all kinds of different uh, puddings and concoctions out of these things. You can eat them fresh. You can cook them and steam them, take off the, uh, the pulp, mix it up with all kinds of good stuff. The other thing, which is very important, is from the breadfruit tree. It only has breadfruit a couple months of the year. But one of the things that they invented uh, is these subterranean fermentation pits. So they dig holes in the ground about this big around, line them with leaves, put in mashed up breadfruit paste, covered over with leaves, and if they took care of that, it would last for about one or two years. So they'd always have a source of that kind of carbohydrate. And what they love to do, if they think, you know, here's a, here's a rubelli, I'm gonna give them some fresh out of the pit. And that's like the strongest, sharpest cheese that you've ever eaten by an order of magnitude more. And they love just to look at the expression on your face <laughs> when you eat that. But what they don't tell you is that if you take this paste and cook it up with coconut cream, it's absolutely heaven. So it's, uh, it's a beautiful food. Now, to some of the wild foods here, of course there's lots of fish, coconut crab. Can you imagine how delicious a coconut crab would be if it spends its whole life eating coconuts? <laughs> so if you ever wanna get a real cholesterol injection, you go for these coconut crabs. And uh, some birds, they're always on the diet right here, and the different kinds of shellfish uh, that are consumed. So a little bit about the excavations. <clears throat> this is a stone fish trap. And as the people line up out here and they gradually move in, slap in the water, and they get the fish holed up inside here and then where they can trap them easily. So you can find these stone fish traps all over the atolls. And then the archeological sites here are really, um, they're not flash archeological sites, believe me. You know, these are not something that'll stand out to uh, the common person and go, wow, that's really interesting. Well, it turns out that they are really interesting. But some of these low mounds right here can be over a kilometer long. These are major villages in areas where you'd think, how did the people actually live here for 2,000 years? But the villages are pretty, pretty big. Okay, so just some of the excavations in progress here. And uh, here I am doing some work here. I just wanted to point out to the uh, non-archeologist in the audience, this black layer right here, this black sediment or soil is what signals to us that there's a rich uh, prehistoric cultural deposit. <clears throat> now these guys here would come out and help us, and imagine being like this, tall. These guys are fantastic because they know what fish bones look like, they know what shellfish look like, they know what charcoal looks like. I don't have to train them. I don't have to show them what to do. They just get stuck into there and they're having a great time, and it's just absolutely it's just fun. It's fun for me, it's fun for them, it's just great. Okay, so I put this forward as a case of resilience. 
typhoons periodically go through the Marshall Islands. They wash completely over the atolls. And I've been there before when there'd be like a king tide and the water would come up on the atoll. And the feeling that you get, I just, the water's rising, it's coming up, the wind's blowing, and you say, geez, you know, there's nowhere to go. I've read historic accounts where Marshallese would climb up a coconut tree. And unfortunately, that's not one of the skills that I've developed over the years. <laughs> you always send a young kid up to the coconut tree to get the drinking coconuts. But in this particular case, we've got a prehistoric cultural deposit. You're looking at the side of a trench here, that black layer that I told you about before. And this storm deposit right here, this entire islet was washed over by a major storm. And then it was reoccupied. So this tells me something about the resilience of atoll dwellers, is that they can take this kind of attrition to their population as well as they know how to survive in these most precarious of environments. So the archeological data, which I've been not talking about, but I just want to say that this is built on a, lots of uh, data over the years. 183 cubic meters have been excavated. Everything's been washed and analyzed. 175 chronometric dates, so I know when the atolls emerged, when the landscapes developed over time, and then the archeological deposits have been dated as well. So, uh, subsistence has been analyzed by looking at over 100,000 bones of fish and birds and turtles, et cetera, over 200, about 200 uh, kilograms of shellfish, about 800 shell adzes, as well as lots of other artifacts. So it's a very large data set. So outcomes of the research, uh, innovations, tapping into the subterranean fresh water, which is something that Atoll dwellers had to figure out. They also had to figure out uh, how to extend the availability of food. One way is the, the Certosperma pits, which I showed you, uh, as well as different varieties of pandanus. There's over 100 varieties of pandanus in the Marshall Islands. They're all named. They all have different ways of being prepared. Sustainability looking at all the food remains. Normally as archeologists, if we have a nice 2000 year sequence as we do here, we can look at what happens to the fish and shellfish over time. Do they get smaller? That would be some evidence that people are not living sustainably. Are they switching different kinds of species? Are they only hitting certain species early on, but then later in time, they're harvesting a lot more different species that are not the big meat packages. Normally people will go after things that are easy, like big shellfish, bigger fish, and over time those things get smaller. But I don't have any evidence of that here. Resilience is that last uh, example that I showed you. Now, so I can pose the question, did people, did these societies live sustainably? either by active management or the result of low human populations or both. So it's probably some manner of those things there. Okay, now my last case study before we wrap up, I want to take a look at sustainable harvesting of the sea. This is in the Hawaiian Islands, working with uh, indigenous communities on the island of Molokai where I've had field research there for over 40 years now. So here's uh, this particular study area on the north coast of the island. This shows a portion of the 10 kilometer long uh, study area. And what I was interested in, because I know, and I've been out here myself uh, collecting limpets, that I know you can go out there, even I can go out there years ago, and uh, collect 20, 30, sometimes 40 kilos of shellfish. And you can see how big they are here. So you can collect a lot of shellfish because they're really dense. This is a very 
a well-known area on the island to get limpets. So in this area, people have lived here for 500 years. Certainly, there must be some evidence that the shellfish got smaller over time if people are, people are hitting this coastline all the time. So I've been working with Mac Poi Poi for about 30 years. And <clears throat> when I told some friends on the island that I wanted to start working in this area, they said, oh, you better talk to Mac. I said, OK. So, so I went and I met Mac out on this coastline. And I sat with him overlooking this beautiful stretch of coastline. I said, you know, um, if you let me do archaeology here, I can tell you how long your ancestors have been living and using this coastline. And what kind of shellfish were they harvesting? What kinds of fish they were harvesting? How big those fish were? What kinds of fish hooks they used to capture those fish? Where they put their, their shrines, their religious shines, shrines called koa? where there's offerings today. You can still see offerings on these shrines that are right on the coastline, where the major temples are located, where the house sites are located. And he said, oh, yeah, I'd like to know that. And I said, Mac, you're on. Excellent. So he's let me work there now for quite a few decades. And what Mac did years ago, he went to the state, state of Hawaii, and said, people are coming over to our land, to our coastline, and they're coming from Oahu, which is about 20 k's away. They come over, they fish, and they leave. But we live here. We're a subsistence people. We live in a semi-subsistence lifestyle. This is not the Hawaii that looks like the Gold Coast. These are people that live on homesteads. They have some animals in their homestead. They fish. They collect salt, seaweed, shellfish. They go fishing. This is what, they, this is what adds protein into their diet. This is an important source of food. They're not just out taking the day off to go fishing. So, incredibly, the government allowed Mac to act <clears throat> as, in Hawaiian, it was called Konahiki, or land manager. And he set up this area right here, which you can see right here, and he actually